I presume you're here in order to learn of Magecraft. I'll have you know, there's no room for the weak willed in this course, and despite your best efforts, the sorcery of our time is but a fraction of what it once was in the Age of Gods. Much of the craft is established through pedigree, and the culture of mages is riddled with deception and moral depravity. That said, if you insist, I shall do my best to educate you in this miserable, yet fascinating world. In our previous lesson, I covered the various meanings behind the term spirit, including fairies, elementals, and servants. That led me to bringing up the mage Eris Utsumi, whose body is inhabited by dread spirits. Her own birth is unique enough that I'd like to broadly cover the idea of mage fertility. We know mages strive to pass on their legacy to their next of kin, but circumstances make that process ever more complex. Thus, for today's lesson, I will speak of mage pedigree. Put bluntly, the potential of any given mage is determined by the number and quality of their magic circuits. While there are convoluted means of compensating for them artificially, a person's magic circuits are obtained at birth, and mages cannot simply gain more circuits through effort. As a general rule, the quality of mage circuits is inherited from parent to child, so the stronger the lineage, the stronger the resulting magic circuits. That said, such a result is never guaranteed, and a variety of factors influence the strength of a mage's bloodline, including their homeland and choice of spouse. Just like ordinary genetics, there is an element of random mutation, allowing for some families to suddenly drop off the map, while others spring up with no prior history. As a result, mage families are often very particular about who they associate with, doing whatever they can to maximize the odds of producing a prolific heir. This involves arranged marriages between already successful families, and to establish these relationships, strong mage families develop smaller branch families. A decent example is the Animosphere family, who has expanded its teachings to the Fellows and Fargo families, among others. The same can be said for the Archisorts, a branch family of the Elmaloi. By keeping familial ties close, it is thought that proper mages can be effectively bred to preserve their unique features. Despite these efforts, it's never certain that a given family will maintain its prominence, nor will weaker families be forever destined to mediocrity. The Aozaki family, for instance, nearly perished over a mere six generations. They weren't especially reputable to begin with, and when its previous heir was born with little to no circuits, there was little hope for the future. Miraculously, however, the next generation of Aozaki mages turned that downhill spiral upside down. Toko Aozaki was born a prodigy with 20 magic circuits, and Aoko was born with obscure circuits that rotate to increase their efficiency. This implies that genetic factors can lay dormant in a family, only becoming active for specific generations. It also means that families that were thought to have died out, or were never considered mages at all, could suddenly develop quality circuits from parents with no potential themselves. If not for this phenomenon, new mage families would never emerge. For instance, was Shiro Emiya's affinity for magecraft just a lucky break, or did his ancestry dabble in magecraft years prior? Mages that understand this can, potentially, manipulate it to their benefit. Such is the case for Misala Escardos, an ancient mage who intentionally deprived his lineage of a proper heir for over 1,000 years. In order to mask his intentions and prevent his children from greedily rushing the process, he adjusted the bloodline such that, with every passing generation, the family would lose its power and forget its purpose. While the family did keep itself afloat, they did so as a useless husk. Their magic crest, while maintained throughout the years, could no longer be read or understood. When the conditions were right, however, a young boy named Flat Escardos was born to finally carry on the family legacy. He could interpret the ancient crest that not even his forebearers could, resulting in him being the strongest heir the family had ever seen. For 1800 years, the Escardos were mocked by the association, but now they had an amazing prodigy capable of blending past spells to create new ones. Another important factor in determining a mage's bloodline is their territory. Mages who base their craft on the rich heritage of their land benefit from staying in one place. Should they leave, or are otherwise forced out, they risk their legacy dying out. 
such as the case for the Isakol family, currently headed by Selenik Isakol Yigidamillenia. Her family dates back as far as the witch hunts of the Middle Ages, during which her ancestors were forced to flee from Western Europe to Siberia. Without their original land to serve as the foundation, the family's bloodline declined. This gave Selenik the idea to volunteer her family to assimilate with the larger Yigidamillenia clan. A similar tragedy befell the Mato clan. Once known as the Makiri, the Matos left their homeland to settle into Japan. For the past 200 years, their legacy fell apart, culminating in the failure that is Shinji Mato. Neither he nor his father had any magic circuits whatsoever. The very last vestiges of the family died off with Shinji's uncle Karia. To revive their family, the elder Zoken called in a favor from his lasting partnership with the Tosakas, adopting Sakura Tosaka to take Shinji's place as the Mato heir. It was far from ideal, because it made inheriting the Mato crest much more dangerous. As you know, magic crests are similar to organs, in the way that, if transplanted into a foreign host, they might be rejected by that host's body. We've seen this in the tragic case of Kairi Shishigo. Thanks to a curse incurred by his ancestors, Kairi was born infertile, unable to have a biological offspring. He was encouraged to adopt a daughter, but because she wasn't related by blood, attempting to transfer his magic crest to her caused her to die during the procedure. With results like that, it's a miracle Sakura was able to inherit the Mato crest at all. Her survival can likely be attributed to her amazing potential as a mage, as well as the bizarre nature of the Mato crest. Rather than a stigmata carved into a single part of the body, the Mato Crest takes the form of various worms that infest the body and feed off its host like parasites. It took 11 years for Sakura to acclimate to the Crest Worms, and even with that, it would only take half a day for the worms to devour her if left unchecked. Needless to say, it is not very efficient. The case of Rin in Sakura Tosaka has me wanting to discuss the concept of mage courtship. If simply being away from their homeland can cause magic circuits to break down across generations, then surely a mage's choice of mate can play a huge factor in the resulting heir. Sakura's father, Tokiomi Tosaka, took a practical approach, selecting his bride based on her ability rather than his own passion. His wife, Aoi Tosaka, was a daughter of the Zenjo family of mages. While she had no magic circuits of her own, a magical factor in her bloodline made her and her ancestors ideal for birthing gifted mages. As such, she gave Tokiomi not one, but two powerful daughters, more than the couple ever needed. Whenever this happens, it is typical for the stronger of the two children to step up as heir, allowing the other child to live a normal life. This is because the family crest can only be passed on to a single heir, if not for the Mato's need for an adopted pupil, Sakura would never have been raised as a mage. It makes sense that the passing of a crest is a critical issue for mage families. Going back to the Awazaki family, controversy stirred when the younger daughter, Aoko, was given the crest despite her sister Toko's superiority. This decision had both daughters fighting to kill each other. Even without a crest, Toko is one of the most talented mages out there. It's eerie to imagine just how powerful she would be with the Aozaki crest to add to her repertoire. Naturally, when it comes to prestige, mages without a crest are considered inferior. Such was the case for Solau Nuada Rei Sofitia Ri. Her brother Bram inherited their family crest, but when he did not succeed as a mage, Solau was arranged to marry Kaneth Elmaloy Archibald to restore their family's standing in the clock tower. Her only value as a mage was seen in whatever future child she would bear for Kaneth. Her blood was more valuable than her individual achievements. Perhaps because of this, Solau only reluctantly complies with the arrangement. She shows Kaneth nothing but disdain and loathing, especially for his cowardly tactics in the Fourth Holy Grail War. On the opposite side, however, it appears that Kaneth truly loves Solau. This can be seen in how Kaneth put his arrogance aside for her, risking everything he had in order to save her life. In that regard, it is definitely possible for mages to genuinely love one another. The only catch is that this love must come second to a mage's responsibility to pass on the family legacy. While we're still on the topic of magic crests, I want to note that, while mages typically only pass their crest down to a single child, there are exceptions. 
One such exception is seen with the Edelfeld family, which has a magical attribute called sisters. Because of it, daughters of the Edelfeld family are born as twins, and they are both capable of inheriting the family crest simultaneously. For instance, a pair of Edelfeld sisters underwent this procedure before participating in the Third Holy Grail War. Despite this ability, the family's current heir, Luvia Gelita, has chosen to take on the crest by herself so that her twin sister can stay safe in Finland. Thus far, we've established the importance of a mage's parents regarding the birth of quality magic circuits. That said, you might be surprised to learn just how significant this can be. Finally, we can mention Eris Utsumi, the only ever recorded case of a human being born from a heroic spirit. Specifically, Eris's father was a human who had a child with his servant Izanami, one of Japan's gods who created the land by churning the ocean with her spear, Ame no Nuboko. This goddess of the underworld was summoned as a divine servant, making love with Eris's father to birth a special child in Mosaic City. As a result, Eris is not your typical mage. She's considered a quasi-servant who fights other servants with her poisonous black blood, composed of dread spirits the throne of heroes rejected. This makes her suitable of the name Grim Reaper, a fighter who wields the Ame no Sakahoko, a replica of her mother's spear, to hunt down renegade servants. This likely has you wondering, how is it possible for a heroic spirit to give birth? While little investigation has been done, the leading theory is that, when a spirit possesses a mortal vessel, it becomes possible for that vessel to carry the pregnancy. Given that Izanami is a divine spirit, she would have needed a human host to manifest as a pseudo-servant. This implies it might be possible for other pseudo-servants to reproduce, and if so, rituals like the Holy Grail War could be used by mages to find potential mates, imbuing their children with divine powers. At the same time, it's also possible that this phenomena is unique to the servants of Mosaic City and its mysterious existence. Still, this wouldn't be the first time a human has been imbued from birth with divine traits. Artoria Pendragon, King Arthur of Britain, was born through a process called conceptual fertilization. Using his magecraft, Merlin was able to imbue the child of Uther Pendragon and Lady Ygraine with the concept of the Red Dragon, a prophesized symbol of Britain's triumph over the invading Saxons. This was similar to how mages carefully select their spouses to achieve the best result. Blue-eyed Ygraine was the most compatible with the ritual. As a result, Artoria was born with a unique heart and magic circuits far superior to any ordinary humans. Her draconic circuits are instead referred to as a magic core, granting her resistance to most forms of magecraft. For the vast majority of mages who strive to one day reach the root, it is assumed that their goals cannot be achieved in a single lifetime. Instead, they hope their legacy will eventually succeed, giving meaning to their life's work. That is why a mage's children are so important, and why mages go to such lengths to try and produce prolific heirs. Whether it be their own child or an apprentice, mages are invested in their future, putting their own satisfaction aside for a long-term goal. Protecting one's pupils is a natural instinct, but not necessarily when an ego gets involved. Short-sighted mages sometimes wish to experience glory in their own lifetime, and the thought of giving that glory to their children, or their children's children, is unbearable. This can result in a mage despising their own pupils, becoming envious while dreading their obsolescence. We can observe this with the father of Kirstaria Wodim. The Wodim family is one of the oldest mage families around, pristinely preserving their magic crest for thousands of years. Hoping to carry on this legacy, Kirstaria's father was devastated to learn that, because of Kirstaria's tremendous talent, the family crest would go straight to him, skipping an entire generation. Jealous, Kirstaria's father lashed out, attempting to have him assassinated, endangering the family's thousand-year-old legacy for one person's selfishness. To err is human, I suppose, and despite what they might tell you otherwise, mages are human. In summation, mage ability is mainly determined from birth. Older, more prestigious families can expect to rear even stronger children, but various factors such as genetic mutations and the lay of the land can render even the greatest family obsolete. To prevent this, mages do whatever they can to prepare for the next generation, carefully selecting their sexual partners to ensure the best offspring possible. Even love and romance take a back seat to a mage's legacy, leading to all manner of familial turmoil. 
It sparks envy, sibling rivalries, political marriages, turf wars, and elaborate rituals, all in the name of a far-off dream to reach the root. It is an exercise in trying to manipulate a system we have little control of, making us question whether it's truly worth the effort. On a similar note, I plan to cover another aspect of Magecraft that is highly genetic. For our next lesson, I will discuss psychic powers and ESP. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, Elise Trash for Skinco, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, The Nonchalant Ostrich, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Lord Omagoden, Free Brick, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Link Pendrago, King Kobo, Observer Bellis, Flash Daniel, Elden Yarbrough, Horsemen of Justices, James Hewitt, Uncanny EXP, Matthew McAfee, Game King 352, Caitlin B, Vladimir Mirovna, Succubus Sakura, Jonathan Padua, The Taz 96, President Irina Vladimirovna Putina, Maxwell's Demon, Kengo X 77, SF Giants Fan Mike, Akakaze Yume, and user C100 Cad1. Thank you all so much.